is a technology conference in part, but we can't figure it out, so <laughs> also particularly in view of that light on me, ironic that this is a privacy conference. Uh, is this mic working? You getting anything from me? Ah, okay, good. Um, these conferences have started, uh, and this is, uh, as you know, the eighth running of it, I uh, believe, um, with an introduction from uh, the folks that have uh, organized it, uh, uh, particularly uh, Bob Daling, who's joining me in this one, Fred Letterer, who unfortunately can't uh, join us uh, today, um, and others. Uh, we try to set the stage a little bit for the two days uh, that are coming, um, and we're going to try to do that um, with a little uh, sort of overview of where we've come from, where we've gone, actually what we think are some principles that have emerged over the, the many conferences. Uh, as the Dean indicated, uh, probably many of us who started in this conference, uh, and of course the first time the question was would you ever do it again and then again and then it became automatic. Uh, maybe not quite automatic, but, it, but um, all of you indicated that it, we should continue to have it. Uh, we probably thought, well, you know, we'd tackle this subject for a few times, we'd figure it, figure it master it, and um, the need for this would, uh, as they used to say in the Soviet era, wither away. Um, now I have a quote which I happened to see the other day that to me sort of typifies uh, where we are with this subject. It's from the Kennedy inaugural. Um, it was about the small subject of the Cold War. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. <laughs> Let us begin. <laughs> There are times in, in this subject in which I kind of feel like that is that um, uh, we're making a little bit of progress, but then technology overwhelms us with this latest little uh, thing, uh, whether it's uh, Twitter or uh, just the internet, uh, when we started and kind of <coughs> overwhelms us uh, and we seem to go backwards on this subject, not forward. Um, but we do think that some principles have come from this. So we're gonna go through a, a few principles. Uh, if it seems like uh, unnecessary reminiscing, remember we're only here for half an hour and we'll get into more substance as we go along. Um, and uh, we do admit we made up this little list on the train on the way down here. <laughs> so uh, we've got seven of these and I'm gonna Say a few words about them, and then and then Bob is, or vice versa. Um, and uh, we, we may pick up these themes in the next couple of uh, days, but we thought they were good themes to leave you with. Um, and these are ones that probably wouldn't have uh, been up in our first conference, and maybe probably wouldn't have been up in our third or fourth conference, but have certainly emerged over the time with our conferences. Uh, some of them may seem obvious today, but in perspective probably weren't so obvious uh, over time. So let's start with the first of those, that there is a privacy interest in public records. Um, there's always been a theory that if a record is public, it's public, um, and there's no such thing as a privacy interest in a public record, it's an oxymoron. Uh, but the confluence of three things uh, which is really what brought us here in the beginning and uh, as we've noticed their growth, um, the digital record, uh, the internet, uh, and data aggregation have clearly shown that um, despite the fact that we might otherwise label a record or information as public, uh, indeed there are privacy interests in it. Uh, one of the things that always bothered me in the course of this uh, conference and I used to uh, comment on is that academics hadn't really gotten in the discussion to give us a good theoretical basis for some of the things we talked about. Um, and I particularly was on this one. Uh, now I think you will find uh, good writings trying to understand 
uh, the, the modern notion of privacy um, in relation to uh, governmental information in particular. Uh, let me recommend uh, a new book by uh, uh, Professor Daniel Solov called Understanding Privacy in the Nice High Tech World. I downloaded it on my Kindle and read it on the way down. Um, it has some particularly good insights on this point. Well, picking up on that, and I hope my microphone works, um, I took a slightly different uh, approach. I looked at the agendas from the first conference or two and sort of compared it to the agenda today. And I know that you know, many of you were, were here in 2001 at the first conference. Um, I think that conference, if, if it had a theme, I would call it theory. You know, the, the world of access to court records was still largely a paper world. Um, so all of those committees that had just started their, their attempts to develop policies and court rules were really talking theoretically because there weren't many records uh, available on the internet. I think now what we see is much more of a practical uh, approach. You see in all of the panels at, at this conference uh, implementation issues, um, practical problems related to providing electronic access to court records. So I see, as a 10-year theme, a transition from theory to practice. And picking up on what Justice Dooley said, I think we also see that the theory is coming full circle. At, in 2001, if you said, I think there's a privacy interest in a public record, people, especially academics, would have looked at you a little uh, uh, you know, with a raised eyebrow. But now you see writings that assert that, uh, legal uh, theoretical writings, wh which I find qu quite interesting. Um, transition back to Justice Dooley for a, a few more comments, and then I'll, I'll make a few more observations about the 10-year uh, retrospective. So on to the second point. Um, OK, we got over the hurdle. We now think there's a privacy interest in public records. Uh, but now we realize that's the only the first point. Uh, now you've got to figure out, OK, if there is a privacy interest, what are you going to do about it? Um, uh, here, I think the most important uh, challenge has been for us how to keep uh, the court system uh, to be a transparent, accountable system in our uh, overall uh, scheme of government um, uh, so that it's transparent. We, uh, the public can fully understand its actions. We don't take them in secret. We explain what we do. Uh, we uh, can see what the inputs were for decision making in that system. But on the other hand, the people who are in the system, uh, in their cases in the system, often not uh, of their own free will. Um, and other uh, uh, concerns about uh, privacy or secrecy that would not fully disclose uh, everything, uh, the trade secrets maybe of a company or uh, a lot of concern about cooperating uh, witness agreements in the criminal side or whatever um, uh, aren't as fully transparent. So how do we uh, make one transparent and not particularly the other? So the uh, inquiry, the fact that we know there is a privacy interest uh, is only our starting point. Uh, how do we balance that privacy interest against the need for the transparency of the system? And I would say over the course of this conference, and it's eight runnings probably, uh, that's been the biggest subject um, that we have tackled uh, in various ways. I'll let you keep moving. OK. Uh, then we come to one that uh, I think is, again, also relatively obvious, but it sort of grows on you over time, which is, uh, wow, this is a technology problem. Um, uh, is technology here our enemy or is technology our friend? Uh, and of course, what we encounter is that it's always both. Um, it's always uh, the problem that uh, got us here, um, but it's always the ability to have transparency in the judicial system that comes from the new technologies uh, that we've got. But wow, if it's a friend, why does it keep biting us? Uh, why do we go in the world uh, now of, uh, we thought we, we're in the world of uh, just records now or, you know, and everything that goes on in courts. That's one of my uh, points coming off. And now we're into tweets. And now we're into people with all sorts of technological devices in our courtrooms who are uh, doing all sorts of interesting new things, which is one of our panel um, uh, going to be uh, uh, this time. 
Um, I, so um, we have to be in the awareness, though, that the technology that gets us into we, if we uh, 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 understand the, how it did it, is the technology we hope will get us out of these problems. And again, looking at the agendas over the years, uh, I would say my key observation on technology is that we have always had the hope that the technologists would help the policymakers figure out how to implement the policies. Uh, and I think that the technologists are doing a fine job, but it's interesting to me to see that at every single conference we have a panel with a name along the lines of the first one, which was using technology to assist in implementing policy goals. That's what we called it in 2001. Uh, the name is not dissimilar here in, in 2010. Yet, in 2010, we have a little caveat to the, to the title, and it says, but why don't courts use the technology? So I find that very sort of disconcerting in a way, because I think that the folks, the judges and the court administrators who develop the rules and the policies have always believed uh, that the technology would be a tool uh, to help. And it is, but it, it hasn't maybe lived up to the, its promise yet. I have high hopes for that. Okay, next is, is one of my favorites over the years, which is our irresistible attraction to practical obscurity, um, or substitute a more understandable term. Uh, that term came from a United States Supreme Court decision to explain how our public uh, court records uh, are not really so public because they're impossible in their paper form to, to find. Um, and the term was practical obscurity. We've, we've turned it into what I call intentional inconvenience. Um, and we have this uh, uh, sort of uh, attraction to it as a policy device, um, I'd probably say a crutch, uh, to get us out of situations in which uh, we want to say that something is public, but we don't actually want it to be very public maybe a public to just the few people who happen to find their way down to the courthouse. Uh, of course, uh, if you go through history, we, th we thought the automobile was a horseless carriage because we always compared everything to what was uh, before. And uh, practical obscurity was never really a policy. It was the effect of lack of technology, um, not really a considered policy. And presumably, at some point, we will work ourselves out of this device uh, for intentional inconvenience, but amazingly, after all these years, we seem to still go back to it uh, regularly in order to find uh, our, our way out of sticky problems. And I would agree with that observation and add a few things to it. I see as a common theme over the decade what I'll call the search for the holy grail of the policy that works for everyone. You know, every court committee that starts the effort is looking for the model, you know, the model policy that will work, that will balance access, that will protect privacy. And you saw it at the first conference in 2001. We had a, uh, the folks from the COSCA Conference of uh, State Chief Justices get up and talk about their model policy. And then, of course, that took off, and some courts followed it, and some courts went their own way. Uh, but here in 2010, I don't think any, there is any convergence on um, the perfect policy. But what I do see is what Justice Dooley is observing. Any place you look, you see the intentional or unintentional reinvention of practical obscurity in some form. And to me, it doesn't matter what your court says. If your court says, we have an open access policy Peel the onion just a little bit, and you will probably find that, sure, we have open records, except, and look at the except clause and see if the except might swallow the open rule. Um, in Minnesota, for example, and if, if, unless I'm mistaken, um, all the court-generated records are open, but anything not generated by the court is not quite open. You know, you need to go find it at a courthouse or you need to go look for it the old-fashioned way. Um, in the federal courts, which I work for, we profess open access, but um, not to 
some of the most sensitive information we hold, which is information in social security cases, information in immigration law, uh, immigration cases. So you'll find that uh, theme running through the court policies nationwide, I think. In California, they take yet a different approach. They'll have whole case types that are simply not available uh, electronically. Uh, and then other case types, which anyone can have remotely uh, from any <coughs> location. So uh, we don't see a one-size-fits-all approach to access and privacy policy, but there is a common theme. And I think the common theme is um, openness with a fairly big asterisk attached to that. OK. Um, uh, last on this page, and we're getting to the end, uh, there is no stopping E everything. Now, I think in, in the world the dean described it, which we might have thought she would come to the solution to all these problems, um, that um, we thought, of course, that we knew where technology would go. We always think it'll go where it is today, and we can think about these problems in relation to where technology is today. Uh, and what always happens is that that's not true. Uh, technology comes up with a new e-everything um, that raises all sorts of problems. And just as we're moving ahead in understanding the problems of the technology of today, it becomes passe. Uh, and the technology of the future gives you something else. Uh, and now we know, I think, there is no stopping it. It's everywhere. It's everything. Um, assume universal transparency of everything um, and talk about how you're going to respond to that uh, as a policy matter. And I would rephrase that by saying the internet complicates everything. In 2001, the internet was a totally different animal. The internet was just the place that the courts could put the records if they wanted to. And very few courts had any records on the internet, so the discussion, as I mentioned, was largely theoretical. Um, in 2010, you see the agenda features entire panels on challenges related to the new internet, to the web 2.0 internet. Uh, we see panels on, on new media and, and, and how the new media are playing out in the courts and in the courtrooms. Um, tomorrow, we'll see a, a, a panel about the federal court public access system and, and all of the, the new um, challenges and, and new uh, initiatives that the federal courts are um, uh, putting forth in terms of public access. And uh, we also have a, uh, a panel on um, um, selective access to court records, which is, of course, related to the tools that the, the internet can provide. OK, the title of this conference has pretty much always been from the beginning, the Conference on Privacy and Public Access to Court Records. But over time, that's become a misleading uh, and too narrow a definition of the subject. This is kind of a corollary of the e-everything and the internet uh, uh, growth, as, as Bob says. Um, this is no longer a conference only on court records. Uh, this is a conference on anything that happens in the judicial system, because it's all becoming transparent. Um, one of the ways, and only one of the ways, we miss Fred Letterer at this conference is that he has been doing in the last couple of conferences he's attended, panels on uh, the in-court uh, activities and records and how those are becoming more and more transparent uh, to the world, uh, the giving of evidence and the appearance of lawyers or jury selection or, or whatever, which is not fully reflected necessarily in the records. And now we're going a step further in this conference um, with the panel that Bob just referred to, we're talking about uh, the folks who uh, are tweeting from our courtrooms and uh, providing a new uh, kinds of transparency within the uh, judicial system. Uh, so it's about all the information in the system. It is no longer about court records only, and maybe over time, court records will be the little part of it. But nonetheless, I would stress that the record, whatever it may be, is still very important to define because that's the starting point for the policies and the rules that all of you are so intimately involved with. Uh, you see this theme repeating over and over again. Where a court starts in terms of what is in the record 
can often determine where a court ends up in terms of how to provide access to it. And so uh, over the decade, uh, there have, you have seen efforts to take bits of information uh, and, and move it around, perhaps make it part of the record officially, perhaps take things out of the record here and there. Uh, the panel tomorrow on selective access to court records will get into that to some extent. Uh, but in several states, for example, there's been an attempt to ask parties and litigants and attorneys to put certain information in places like sensitive information forms uh, is, a, is a term often used. Put that information in a, in a place uh, where the court can then segregate it and not provide access to it. And so, in effect, take information out of the record uh, as, a, as a policy goal uh, to protect privacy. And I think that's a recurring theme and um, something that we've, we've seen develop over the 10 years of this conference. And, and finally on this, if we ever, ever, ever figure out how to get the policy right, um, we still have amazing problems in implementing whatever policy uh, we uh, come up with. Um, most of us in the states and in the federal government have uh, by now, by some rule or device, prohibited uh, the uh, display of social security numbers uh, in public access to court records. Um, and so we all have policies that says that shouldn't go out, and then uh, study after study after study looks at our records and finds social security numbers all over them. Um, and uh, we're, not, we're clearly not uh, yet able to implement that policy in a way to assure at least 100% we're not going to have them. Uh, we did have the uh, last time of the time before, um, uh, Tom Clark uh, presented us the improvements that are happening in redaction technology uh, so that we have some opportunities to get better and uh, better, but um, we still on this one aren't at the point in which we can say we can declare victory uh, as an implementation matter to whatever the policy is. And that is, of course, just one small policy among the many, many, many uh, that we've enacted in this uh, particular area. Uh, this is a time in which I get to point out that one of the great strengths of this conference has been uh, that it's a joint federal state policy and many states have come, uh, certainly a majority by now, but I would say an overwhelming majority of the states have come to this. Uh, uh, there is an opportunity to exchange uh, views and approaches and every time I come to this conference I come back with four or five things that somebody has come up with that I wouldn't have thought of. Uh, that were uh, great new ideas. Of course, I always leave my friend Bob Dillon with the tweak that all the innovation in this area has come from the states. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to comment on that. Well, well, you know, wait for our federal, my federal court colleagues can talk about that. But I did just want to add one, um, one note about the conference as a whole uh, before we end. And, and I don't know, Justice Dooley, if you have more substance. No. But if you, this is your first time here, uh, I want you to know, we would, Professor Hulsa wants you to know, everyone here wants you to know, this is not um, a, a talking head sort of conference. This is a working conference. Everybody's an expert here. Participation is, is what makes it work. Um, and hopefully this setting will, will be conducive to that. Uh, so I, I think the panelists would, will agree, or the moderators I hope will agree, that we're looking for interruptions. You know, we're looking for questions. We're looking for the dialogue. Uh, don't feel hesitant to speak up. And um, with that, I think we'll launch into our... Um, yeah, our let, let me just leave you with one thought. This is sort of our uh, uh, ruminations about the conference and where we are and where we've come from and a little bit of where we're going. Uh, as we said, we did it on the train on the way down from DC. Uh, if any of you particularly liked it and would like to join this kind of dialogue or thought it was terrible and would like to correct us, There'll be a next conference, a next train down from D.C., and you're welcome to join us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we'll just move right into the first panel then.